The Batteries Included podcast is brought to you with United Chargers. United Chargers presents the Grizzly range of EV chargers. There's the original Grizzly Classic, a powerful, heavy-duty, portable EV charging station built to withstand the toughest conditions. The Grizzly Duo, a dual-port unit designed to charge two vehicles at the same time. The Grizzly Mini, a small, portable charging station built with an indoor-outdoor rated cast aluminium enclosure. And the Grizzly Smart, a revolutionary smart EV charger. All Grizzly chargers come with a convenient 24-foot cable and the ability to adjust the current from 16 amps all the way up to 40 amps. That's 9.6 kilowatts. Plus, they're IP67 rated. Built in Canada with the highest quality materials, order yours now at unitedchargers.com. That's unitedchargers.com. Hello, welcome to the Batteries Included podcast. It's February the 9th, 2024, and this is episode number 23. Thank you very much for joining us. On today's show, we'll be talking about the debut of the fantastically refreshed Porsche Taycan, the freshly launched Mercedes E Sprinter, and Rivian R1T and R1S getting new battery options. And of course, much, much more. I'm Dominic Yoni. Joining us today is the irrepressible Mr. Tom Malagny, Senior Editor at Inside EVs and host of the YouTube channel State of Charge. And of course, Kyle Connor joins us from the majestic, practically palatial halls of Autospec Studios, where he produces high-voltage videos for a number of YouTube channels. Hey there, everybody. Good What's to see guys? you all. Good morning. All right. Uh, right. So, so last week, we heard from Kyle. Uh, I'll just say Martin just can't be with us today, but uh, he'll be back. Uh, hopefully, yeah, on a Battery Bargains episode coming your way uh, early next week. So last week, we heard from Kyle all about how the refreshed Porsche Taycan charges like an absolute monster. And we can touch on that again. But right now, we have the full details on this car. So, And of course, Kyle, you have a great video up on out-of-spec uh, reviews, taking, video, uh, taking viewers all around the outside and inside of the car and show, sharing all the new changes, which is very cool. It's a good video. So, um, basically, the uh, 2025 Porsche Taycan has more power, more range, faster charging. It also has adaptive air suspension as standard. The uh, exterior design has been tweaked a bit. It's a little, it's pretty subtle. Uh, so I think most people will have maybe have some trouble kind of seeing the difference. But uh, the top trim, the Turbo S, can put out 938 horsepower now with launch control, and it's said to do uh, a 2.3 second zero to 60. That's getting very close up into the plaid territory, I think. Um, lower trims also have more power, uh, with the base Taycan getting over 80 more horsepower. So all of these improvements come from a new motor with uh, 80 kilowatts more power, a bigger battery that's also lighter, a modified pulse inverter, revised thermal management, and a next-generation heat pump, among other things. So it sounds like this car can not only put out more power, but it's also more efficient, and so it can put out that power without, you know, overheating and we'll talk about this possibly derating i don't know a lot of the improvements stem from a change in the battery pack because evs are at their core you know it's all about the batteries so porsche offers two options the 105 kilowatt hour gross 97 kilowatt hour usable capacity battery it calls the performance battery plus which is standard on the upper trims the turbo and turbo s it also has an it also has an 89 kilowatt hour gross pack, 83.6 usable. Uh, that's standard on the base Taycan and Taycan 4S. But I think you can you can option those two. I think with the bigger battery as well. Uh, the chemistry of the cells has changed, so it's got more nickel, less cobalt, which is a good thing. So despite holding uh, 11.6 kilowatt hours more than the old pack, the pa the new one actually weighs 19 pounds less, which is pretty amazing. I think I'm, that's kind of blows me away. So we don't have an official EPA range number yet, but the big pack, along with uh, all the other changes, adds about 100 miles more of range. Porsche says the real world range is about 364 miles. So I don't know. Tom, what do you think about this refresh? I should probably share something with that. Well, I'm pretty surprised you tossed it to me. Kyle's the one that drove it, but um, I'm sure right. Kyle will get some uh, input on this oh, later. Yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah. yeah. No, overall, um, it's, uh, you know, how do you criticize it much uh porsche one of the things i love about uh porsche is they they went in and really went to the bones of the tycon to make it better it's not just a refresh where they you know changed the dash a little and tweaked the bumper and made some things they went at the heart of the car and made everything better they made the battery better longer range lighter 
Uh, the battery's lighter now. I think it was about 20 pounds lighter, even though it's, you know, has more capacity. Um, it, 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 they, they went after the things that made makes it a better EV, not just a better looking vehicle. It charges better, better range. I mean, uh, you know, I, I was super impressed at what Porsche did with this. I was not personally expecting it. I hadn't really been in touch with them as far as I, I was expecting a, a refresh, but I didn't expect them to go this far. And I think they did a fantastic job with it. And uh, Taycan has been selling well. I mean, I think they were selling, they sold about 40,000 of them last year. They've sold, I think, 130,000 so far, Taycans. So it, it's not like it, it was slumping. So Porsche was like, my God, we, we've got to, you know, we've got to do something here to make this thing better. It was already doing really well, and they went out and made it that much better. So I'm um, I'm really happy to see that they didn't just, uh, you know, tweak a few things, make it look a little different, and say, oh, here's the refreshed vehicle, which a lot of manufacturers do. Porsche spent a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of effort into making it a better electric vehicle, not just a better-looking car. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm I'm super impressed with it. Right on. Kyle, what, what is it that really stands out to you? What's like the big thing on this new new refresh that's, you know, your top top line improvement? Uh, it just means your road trips got a whole lot quicker. This is all about fast traveling. And knowing a lot of the engineers that worked on this, they are obsessed with the out of spec method of road tripping, which is, you know, get down to zero, plug it in hot, ride the charging curve, and then blast to the next station. And since they're in Germany, they can blast to the next station at very high speed. So we have an enhanced cooling package. Uh, I think it's 17 kilowatts of heating power, 12 kilowatts of cooling power. I'm going to do a whole deep dive podcast. I have all the nerd details on a lot of that. We have 400 kilowatts of regen now, which is crazy. You have, again, 97 kilowatt hours usable, but the pack weighs less than before. Um, most of that is actually because the bottom plate is now a carbon uh, polymer uh, rather than a steel plate is my understanding. So a lot of it isn't from the cells. It's from the total pack being lighter. Yeah. The um, Yeah, what else should I say about it? 320 kilowatt peak charging into the battery, about 336 delivered, 335, somewhere around there. And it doesn't come under 300 kilowatts until 65%. So you're just sitting maxed out the whole way. It's truly crazy. The efficiency has been enhanced. There's a new primary uh, electric drive on the rear axle and uh, still uses the two speed, which I think is a bummer. I wish it didn't, at least in the lower trims, maybe the Turbo S if they really needed that acceleration figure. Yeah, sure. Okay. Maybe that makes sense. But ultimately, yeah, that's always the clunkiest part of the car. And um yeah, air suspension is standard, as you mentioned. Porsche Active Ride, very expensive, $7,000 plus option. I think worth it, but only yeah. for someone who's a real driving enthusiast or wants the comfort features of the car raising up when you open the door and things like that. But it's a really complicated suspension. I also know the guys who engineered that, and it was very cool. So um, that, that, suspension, that suspension, so when you're driving, it kind, of, is that, it kind of tilts the car into the turn a little bit? Is that what's happening with that? Yeah, so, other things or? so that's not its main purpose. Okay. Uh, okay. So those are the comfort, like over-exaggerated features where, yes, if you turn into a left-hand corner, it will bump up the right side of the car. You'll lean to the left, and it feels a bit like you're on a motorcycle cool. as you drive. And it's – I hate it. I really don't. Right. Like, I hate <laughs> that. And then when you hit the brake, the front comes up, and if you floor it, the nose goes down. I mean it's okay. it's – not my thing those right. features what is my thing is you have no physical sway bars on the vehicle and you have complete variable roll stiffness adjustment through the hydraulic dampers and you have each uh suspension damper is fed with a five kilowatt electric motor using silicon carbide inverters they're little permanent magnet motors in there and there's four of those so in theory your suspension uses 20 kilowatts not that it ever will and in right. fact like 99.9 percent .9 of the time it's off so there's no range hit uh for having this it's only when you do something that it needs to bump up that side for um, but they actually regen when you pump in the fluid back which is kind of cool so there's it's just really crazy and i i think it's worth all the seven grand but again the benefit is for comfort and also, re you know, really increasing performance on track because you can individually now play around with how you want to push a tire down into the ground with this suspension. So 
you can actually go faster. Uh, the car rides better completely. You know, if, if one side of the road has a bunch of potholes and, and ju- you know, junk in it and the other side doesn't, you won't get a lot of head toss. It'll just let the right side deal with all the bumps and it won't affect the left side of the vehicle. Oh, nice. So that sounds R- good. Rivian has something similar to this, but they do it on a per axle basis. So they right. can stiffen and let go of the dampers on the front axle and the rear axle. Here it's left and right side. Nice. Um, real quick, uh, learning fast ask: At what speed do the uh, does Taycan shift the gears? I think it's yeah. The the two speed transmission tuning has been changed for this okay. generation. It now shifts about ten kilometers an hour earlier to get into second gear. Um, so my guess is, if you're doing a wide open, I think it'll shift at forty five or fifty miles an hour. And there's positive torque because it jams the next gear. So you get a a bump in acceleration, which is also why they wanted the two speed. So for the same power, your ratio off the line can be better. And then you get a positive torque gear shift. You jam second gear. It'll actually chirp the tires in the uh, high spec cars. And, you know, it gives you another jolt to get to 60 even quicker. Right. So I mentioned. Sounds good when you think about that, but then it's very clunky. I don't know. I still don't like it. Yeah. It adds, and it adds weight and complexity and yeah that. complexity and it's like just take it off the standard cars because the only one zero to 60 should matter is maybe turbo s um but that's right. just they won't they don't do that so so i mentioned it has a it's got a better cooling so the original one could you get that to derate can you get actually get it hot enough to, to derate or is no yep absolutely you could oh, okay. um so it's i've done a whole video where i drove the Taycan Turbo Sport Turismo in Germany. Top speed down the Autobahn, hitting chargers, back up to top speed, and yeah, you'd hit turtle mode after a charging session. And this one, you still can get to D-rate, actually, during a charging session. Okay. So the max allowable temperature is 55 degrees Celsius, and um, yeah, the, the Porsche guy said, basically, we could we could probably push it to 60 degrees Celsius, but they, they felt comfortable. But my understanding is the cell manufacturer had a spec as to where they wanted the cells to operate. And it's this conversation that's ongoing between Porsche and the cell manufacturer to say, Porsche's like, hey, we've done cell characterization. You know, we we ultimately think we can do this, but they don't want to lose the warranty from the cell manufacturer. So they're only willing to go, you know, as far as that it would be silly for them to lose the the their you know back end warranty, is my understanding. So um, you know, because Porsche has to guarantee the car. So that's that's kind of how that works. So I I think they they should get another three three to five degrees Celsius out of this pack, and it would be perfect. Um, right. Uh, sure. Um, Shreyash, sorry, I'm I'm struggling this morning. I, I'm kind of sick this week. Shreyash Anand asks, doesn't a multi-speed gearbox have inefficiency benefit on the highway? Say a two times taller gear for the highway for better range. Uh, yes. Yeah, I don't know, man. I was looking at different final drive ratios last week. I, I saw this. I was got this question on social media, and you know, I, I could see you know different drive ratios kind of all over the place, and and with better results than the, than the Taycan in some respects. So I'm I'm not. I think it's a little different since the since the torque levels are so high on these electric vehicles. I'm not sure that there's a the benefit of having you know the I'm not sure if there's like a... Well, some of the most efficient cars on the road today don't use a two-speed transmission. And then... Right. right. There's like the, Lucid doesn't have, doesn't have a two-speed. Lucid does not use it. The original Ionic, which is the efficiency king, does not use it. I mean, yeah. there are downsides to spinning an electric motor really fast. But I right. think you also have internal gear train loss with a two-speed and some other things that are adding weight and drag. So, yeah. Right. Yeah, I always it's, think it's more about fam- power. I always think most famously about the uh, the Remac Navara. Originally, it didn't have a two speed transmission, and then the Plaid came out, and they had to. It wasn't quick enough, so they had to make it quicker. So they put in a two speed transmission, but it really bugged Mate to have to do that. So he went and re engineered it again and made it like a single speed. Uh, right. I think I feel like uh, Tom's laughing at me for bringing up the Remax Navara. <laughs> <laughs> it's my favorite car. I don't know. I guess. And the original Roadster had a two-speed that they had to oh, that's true, get rid right? of. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, they had. Man, that was a whole kettle of fish there. The the original one, they couldn't uh, they couldn't keep it. Kept breaking it basically. Just electric torque is. I mean, it's a lot of 
more torque than they had been used to. I think I think they probably have all that kind of under control now. They can engineer a proper, you know, gearbox for an electric vehicle if they needed to. But yeah, that was, was seventeen, eighteen years ago. So you know, right, a lot of progress <laughs> has been made. That's right. That's right. A lot of a lot of learnings have happened. Um, okay, we don't need to spend a whole lot of time on this, but the the prices are a little higher than they used to be. I think it's, now it's starting at ninety nine four for the base Taycan, which is man, this thing's an expensive car. Uh, and then you can get up the the cross the top Turbo S cross Turbo. Somebody was asking earlier actually if the Turbo Turbo S is coming back, and, and it is, and it's up to. Uh, Two hundred eleven thousand seven hundred dollars for the Turbo S Cross Turismo. That's like the wagon version. That's without options. I spec my dream Turbo S Cross Turismo the way I would want it, and I didn't okay. even put everything on there. I just said, "What? What's all the stuff I need?" And and nothing I don't really need, like none of the stupid interior deviated stitching that you can go crazy on, all that stuff. And it was two hundred and forty nine thousand six hundred and something dollars. I mean, holy smoke. So then you got to go, okay, well, these things, if you look at the values of used Tycons right now, right. used Tycon, you can get yeah. all the cross Turismo for a hundred grand. And so the used ones, the old, the current generation, it's still an amazing car. And you can get a really high spec car on the used market for a reasonable amount of money. And that is my recommendation. If you, unless you got all the money in the world and just want the newest, craziest tech, go for a used one, get a certified pre-owned or something like that. The, the original car still is almost the benchmark for fast traveling. It's in that upper echelon, if you will. And um, yeah, I, the, oof, the, what's, what's actually kind of interesting is the small battery on the new car is better in almost every metric than the old car's big battery. Wow. Cool. Which is also crazy because it charges at the same 270 kilowatt rate, but holds it longer than even the old car. So maybe you go for a new base one or an old high spec one. Um, depending the, on the, your the, preferences. The new small battery doesn't charge at 320? The small battery is charging yeah. at 270 peak. Okay. Uh, so the, the big battery does charge at the top. Say They say it peaks at 320, but you charged it. You got you saw more than that, right? Not into the battery. So that was oh, into the battery. Okay. It's 320 kilowatts. The I car will re request 400 amps into the battery, but it will go over a 400 amp request to compensate for HVAC load, AC compressor, and whatever other stuff pumps the car needs to run during the charging process. So you'll find another 15 or 18 kilowatts on top because there's also losses and some other things of, of what goes into the battery pack. I just find it's amazing that they can sell thousands and thousands of these at those prices. I mean, Porsche's never of... had a trouble selling an expensive car. True, right? It just kind of just boggles my mind because yeah, I'm not, I don't I don't play in those in, in those. Uh, it's a little bit uh, different than than our audience too. I mean, the Taycan owners, so many of them. I have a friend who has a 911 Dakar, a GT3 RS, and he dailies a Taycan Cross Turismo. He's not an EV guy. He's just right. like I got you know I got 50 Porsches in the garage, whatever, and I'm just going to drive their electric one around town. And that's I think a lot of Taycan owners are. I, either the ones that are doing the lease into the small battery rear wheel drive to get the looks, to get all the, you know, still an amazing car, but at a reasonable price, this one's gone up in price significantly, but at least at a reasonable price on the last car. And then you have the guys who, you know, are hardcore Porsche guys that this is the only electric car they would consider. So um, certainly it's expensive. Uh, it's not a mass market car. It's not ever going to be a mass market car, but it is a, a technological benchmark in terms of charging performance in our market. There are some Chinese cars that can do some crazy things. I've never personally witnessed them, but I want to. Uh, but at least for the U.S. market, this should have the best curve, C rate, and uh, you know the balance of charging over driving efficiency than than any other car I can think of right now. We'll have right. to see if Lucid has a response to this, if they can juice up their uh, charging curves a bit, because no question the Lucid Air is, I still believe, more efficient than this car and okay. better packaging in terms of space space efficiency on the inside. Um, you know, styling, I love a wagon. I love the way the Cross Turismo looks, but 
Um, you know, th this we're really getting into the fun battles. And then you look at Tesla charging curve, and I say this as a plat owner, like, wow, just terrible. <laughs> like, my, my car only holds full power, which is only 250 kilowatts in this case, to 36%, and then it nosedives down. This is still doing 300 kilowatts at 65%. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Those crazy charging numbers. Um, yeah. So, so what's, I had there's some comments I wanted to share. Oh, uh, this is a little little beside the point, but Linda Campbell says loving our used 2019 e-tron. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, it looks a bit similar from the back, and it does. Like looking at the styling, the nice clean lines in the back of the uh, of a new Tycon. Um, someone was mentioned tires really quick. Oh, there we go. Uh, those new Hank. Hankook Ion Evo tires are insanely inefficient. I have them on my Model 3 Performance, and I am averaging under 3, 230 watt, watt hours per mile, which is good. I wonder at what speed learning fast are you, are you getting that? I mean, I guess overall. But overall, so I guess. Yeah. That, that sounds really good. But well, what was he getting before he put those tires on? That's what right. I'd like to know. There's a whole lot of things that could be going on, too. It's hard to... Uh, so I'm thinking I have a uh, Tesla Model 3 rear-wheel drive, but it's got 19-inch wheels on it, so it's going to be... It, it uses more energy than, than maybe one with 18 inch wheels. There's so many little variables around. I definitely would love to try out those tires though. Uh, not shallow ask Kyle, when are you going to China? You going to China? Uh, no, no, no current plans. We've had them, yeah. but I'm sure, like I said last year before the end of the year, and then we didn't make it last year. So yeah. Right. Um, as soon as possible. Right. Hey, and that's true. Uh, Tom used to go to China fairly regularly before the uh, pandemic and all that stuff. Any, any look? I've been invited a few times. I just um, didn't work in my schedule. I right. was invited to go to the an auto show. I don't know if it was Shanghai or Beijing, just like last month and uh, okay. or two months ago. I forget right. I think November ish, uh, and I just couldn't. Um, I couldn't. Right. Uh, it didn't work. It's it's a you know you really have to carve out a good part of your schedule. It's not one of those things you can fly for a couple of days and come back. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, it's like a 10 day thing between getting there, doing what you need to do, coming home, getting adjusted to the time and everything. And um, I just didn't see the value in it uh, for that particular, just to go to the, the auto show, you know, and yeah, I was going to get to drive a few cars, but like, if I go, I want to do what Kyle is talking about doing. And we even talked about maybe doing something together at some point, you know, get, go there, get a whole bunch of cars lined up and drive the hell out of them for a while on, you know, roads and everything. But it's hard because you have to get a Chinese driver's license. I had mine, but it expired. Oh. And there's not a lot of places you can get it. Most of the places you go, you have to pass a test. I think, I believe there's only two places in all of China that you can get a, a temporary Chinese driver's license without f passing a test. Oh, yeah. um, and uh, I went to one of them the last time. Ob obviously, I couldn't do it. I had to have an interpreter there with me, fill out the paperwork for me and everything. And and I got it, but it it only lasts for like a month. I still have mine, but if we go, we've got to schedule an appointment at that place, get our licenses, have the cars lined up. So, I mean, that's I'm guessing that's why it never happened with Kyle. There's a lot of work you have to do ahead of time, and it it really cuts at least ten days to two weeks out of your schedule and you you see what kyle he, he doesn't have 10 minutes at some point so right but you yeah, will get there sooner or later i just have so many so much great product over there right now there's just so many so many brands and, and cars it's just like a constant you know if you if you look at the chinese auto websites it's mm -hmm. just it's just like an it endless is. flow of new stuff it looks and some of it's like really cool some of it's I, not a, go ahead no I, I was gonna say i agree but you have yeah. to understand it's not like us going to europe or somewhere and getting a car and doing our tests and stuff it's different. You know, there's, there's, you know, it, 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 the, the companies aren't just going to give Kyle a car and say, here, have fun for, for, for four days with it. Like they do right. here. It's, it's much more controlled. There's cameras everywhere. Like, you know, it's, it's, you it think requires so? I mean, a lot that's of planning. Not, that's not the impression I've gotten from. So I've, I've spoken to Neo and Xiaoping about going over there and they're like, yeah, take whatever you want, do whatever you want with it. I don't know about working with the smaller ones. I mean, I've, I've reviewed Chinese cars in Europe, and they were just like, take it, see you later. Um, and that was working with the Chinese teams to get the cars there. But but maybe the smaller ones are sketchy like that. Well, well understand this also, Kyle. That all the, the, the all the HMI and the vehicles are going to be in Chinese. Um, all the road signs and everything's in Chinese. There's different 
traffic patterns and everything. Oh, it's not as be easy. Great. It's not as easy as what you're thinking. You're going to need somebody there helping you. Um, you know, there's cameras everywhere, you know, where you're getting, you know, you, you you're, you're piling up the tickets if you're going oh. down the street the wrong way <laughs> and everything. You know, I've, oh, I've done a lot hilarious. of driving in China. It's until you get used to it, it's not easy. Yeah, and, I would and, love and that. nothing's in English. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it'll be fun, but it requires a lot of preparation. That's all I'm saying. It's not like yeah. just going to, going to, you know, Norway and saying, give me a car to, I want to try out the new, uh, uh, you know, um, battery swap stations. It's, it's, it's fun, but it's a lot of work. And I found it very helpful to have a company representative with me at all times in, in case. I mean, even going to the, 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 uh, like just driving, you need special apps. You can't pay at toll booths. You have to have the, 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 um, apps on your phone to, to swipe them against the thing. It, there's all little things like that, that we don't think of, and you just won't function if you don't have somebody there helping you. Hey, real quick, just to go back to the, the Tycon for a moment, uh, Alhum asks, Kyle, does Tycon use induction motor now or permanent magnet? I believe it's permanent magnet on the bureau, right? At least. Dual, dual permanent magnet with no disconnect still. Okay. No, no, okay. No. Yep. So same as Lucid, same as Plaid. No All permanent magnets, no disconnects. They have a virtual disconnect where they say basically they don't have to apply any current while cruising okay. up to a certain speed, uh, which I think is somewhere around 100 miles an hour, I think, plus or minus. Maybe I'm forgetting. I know Lucid is extremely high. I can't remember. So they do have basically a virtual disconnect, but there's, yeah, they are both okay. permanent magnets. And, and the way that the also. magnets sit within the rotor now are different, different laminations than before. Uh, oh, so there have been okay, some right, improvement. Right. right. It's a more powerful motor, so it's a slightly different design. Mm -hmm. um, Al also asks, this model is Nax at launch, so the North American charging standard, that's the Tesla connector, and I don't believe so, right? No, so I had dinner with my friend Sarah, who's responsible for charging topics on Tycon, and she and I spent a lot of time discussing what should they do? Should they have okay. a dual NAC port? Should they have a CCS and NAC port? Should mm -hmm. one NAC port? Because right now one side is DC and AC, which is the CCS combo on one side, and the other side's just AC. But she's like, but uh, it's a NAC port, so people are gonna think they can plug the DC port in there. Um, but she's like, there's no packaging room to run the DC lines. So they're all having these uh, discussions at the moment. They're right in the heart of figuring out what to do uh, and how to implement everything. And of course, you need extra control boxes on the car because you have to run DC and AC on the same lines. So it requires an extra, extra, more expensive hardware component. I'm all for pushing for NACs. I think we all agree this is the correct choice. I'm very pleased with it. But it is not the smoothest and it is not going to be the smoothest transition. Right. So, so Max Patton asks or says, Tom and Kyle figuring out how to navigate China in bleeding edge EVs would make for a great reality series. And, yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. It would be great. <laughs> I want to drive from like Beijing to Shanghai. It's a long drive. I, I could, yeah. I think it's like 500 miles. I, I, I could be wrong with that, but I know it's a long drive. And I had talked to one, I actually talked to Xpeng about doing that. And they're like, yeah, we, you know, w you know, take one of our cars and, um, you know, drive, you know, from the two, two, two spots. And I was trying to do that around the auto show and okay. cause they wanted me to come to go to the auto show and, uh, and report on what they were doing at the auto show. Um, and even possibly sit in that, that flying car thing. Um, oh. and, uh, but, uh, when we couldn't set up the, uh, the drive at right after the show, cause I said, we'll go to the show. And then right after the show, I'm going to hop in a car and drive, you know, the 500 miles do charge recordings, all that stuff and everything. When they couldn't set up that second half, I was like, okay, yeah, I'm out. You know, that's that's really why I wanted to go. You want me to do the auto show, I'll do that for you. You give me the car and let me drive 500 miles across China. Uh, and uh, that since it didn't happen, I didn't do it, but we'll, we'll see. Right on. All right. Uh, and just to put a bow on the uh, the Tycon conversation, That's uh, you can order those now, the new ones, the 2025 version, and they'll be start deliveries this summer. All right. So this week, another vehicle made its debut and let's see if I can actually <laughs> see if this is working right. It is awesome. Okay. And then bring back my notes. Uh, 
the Mercedes-Benz eSprinter has just been released. The uh, Basically the opposite of the Porsche Taycan. The eSprinter is a large van with a small motor on the rear axle. You can get it with either a 100 kilowatt motor, that's 134, 134 horsepower, or a 150 kilowatt motor, 200 horsepower. The battery is 113 kilowatt hours at usable, LFP, which is good for an EP estimated 200 miles of range. 10 to 80 percent charging is given as 42 minutes which is not great but actually should be enough for this use case uh, it will most likely be charged uh, at night on ac which takes 12.5 hours from zero to 100. it has a top speed of 75 miles an hour so combined with the range i think it's fair to say this is a this is more of a work vehicle than a road tripper it, it holds 488 cubic feet of, of cargo and has a max payload of 2624 pounds so you know to all over two and a quarter ton which is uh, quite good i think prices start at 71,886 for the standard motor and 75,316 for the high output motor mercedes says uh, up to 80 percent of its commercial customers at least its vehicles so the more powerful version can be had for 998 dollars uh, a month for 36 months uh, with $6,386 down. Uh, there's not a whole lot of competition in the van segment yet. So basically you can get the Ford E-Transit, which starts at 51.5, but that only uh, that offers like half the range that this has and not quite all the cargo space with its high roof version. So um, so Tim St Tom, Tim Stevens did a, a first drive piece for Inside EVs on the e-sprinter. And he remarked that uh, he might like this van more than the Ford F-150 Lightning. So how how is he so wrong i don't know seriously what do you think of this package uh, i'm surprised you're even asking me that question yeah <laughs> about I mean, comparing it to the lightning so right, there's right, two right. things here first thing the mercedes e sprinter love it i've had the chance to play around with one not drive one um okay. i've said this on the sh show many times i'm sure the the, the followers here are tired of hearing me saying um e electric delivery vans are fantastic um, there's that we should have had them before we even had electric passenger vehicles because these companies that own the fleets of these, they have set routes. They know exactly how far it needs to go. They know if it's going to work for them. Their wife doesn't call them up, you know, at, uh, when they're on the way home and say, Oh honey, I forgot. You got to go pick up laundry here and quarter milk here. And now all of a sudden there's not enough range to get home. These things have set routes with set cargo. I you know I have friends that own businesses that have fleets of vans. My uncle, my business partner that owned the property in Montclair with me, they all own their own different businesses and they have like 20, 30 vans. Matter of fact, I drove one of my uncle's sprinters yesterday. Um, I needed to borrow a van for a little bit and he gave me one of his business vans. Sprinters are awesome vehicles. Kyle has one for, uh, you know, um, the, the conversion one, which is probably represents a very, very small percentage of the overall e-sprinters being sold. Most of them are used for business. Drive anywhere and you see them all over the roads. You almost don't even notice them anymore because they're everywhere. Uh, so th this, 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 the specs for it are fantastic. Um, I don't really care about the DC fast charge speed. As I've said before, it doesn't matter on these delivery vents. They're not going to be DC fast charged. These things are going to be used for daily driving. They come back to the depot and they get plugged in and charged on AC overnight. Of course, some of them are going to DC fast charge, but that's such a small percentage. I don't focus on DC fast charge speed. I don't think the delivery vans, I don't think people should buy the, the optional faster DC fast charge rate. I know the European version has standard with 50 kilowatt and then 115, I think, for, uh, for, for the optional. I'm not, maybe in the U.S. there, it's standard at the 115. I'm not, I'm not sure if it has the optional. Sometimes they just put all the standard stuff here. Um, and I didn't get that from the Tim's uh, article, which the second part of my answer here is going to focus on the uh, Tim Stevens article on Inside EVs. You know, I'm a senior editor at Inside EVs. Love Tim Stevens. Um, I, I've known him for a long time. He actually invited me when he was this the uh, managing editor at Engadget. He invited me to take my Mini E in 2009 or 10 to an, the annual Engadget party. Engadget used to throw like a party every year. Oh, nice. And I parked it in front of the front door and stood out there and everybody that came in, hundreds of people, it's like this big party, everyone wanted to ask me about this electric car because nobody had electric cars back then. It was my Mini E and it was 50 people that owned Tesla Roadsters. 
back in 2009. And uh, it was so cool. I got to talk to all these people all night. Uh, the drinks were flowing. The food was there. And everybody had a blast. Um, so I really respect him. And he's a great journalist. This was the worst piece that he's ever read. And, well, and, uh, and, and let me explain why. I didn't learn anything about the van, elect, like its, its, its use case. First of all, he compared it with a Ford F-150 Lightning. Why would he do that? The whole article, he's comparing it with a Ford F-150 Lightning. People aren't cross-shopping this with a Lightning. Why didn't he compare it to the Ford Transit EV or the Ram Promaster EV? It's a freaking electric delivery van. Yeah, so I, couldn't, I didn't understand that. Uh, I couldn't either. understand that at all. It was almost as if he didn't know there were other electric vans or the Bright Drop or, you know, Amazon van, you know. So the whole article, he's comparing it with, with F-150 Lightning. Uh, and then you read down and he's talking about, like, He's complaining it doesn't have a HUD. Who the hell needs a HUD on an electric delivery van? And 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 also, he doesn't even mention AC charging. He just just said the uh, um, DC fast charging was at max at 115 kilowatts, with no like AC charging information, which is what almost everybody that uses this van is going to do. And I hate to keep beating up Tim because he's yeah. a great guy and he's he a is, great yeah. journalist. He really yeah. is. He 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 writes some great articles. This was not one of them. I, I didn't, think, if, if I'm a perspective, like I, he wrote it from the article, uh, from the uh, perspective of somebody who's looking for a, like a, a car. Like, like it's not, if, if, if I owned a fleet of vehicles and I wanted to learn about like this, this, I might want to buy this for my fleet. I, there was almost nothing useful in that article that talked about it. That, you know, Mercedes came up with an all new electric powertrain, the EATS powertrain. It's got a, 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 a ultra efficient motor. It's got this new electric um, axle. Uh, it, it's not even mentioned in there. And when I talked to Mercedes, that's the all they kept telling us about how how proud they were about this new. Uh, electric powertrain how it's it you know wasn't in their previous version it was all developed in-house it's like it's super efficient um it's not even mentioned in that article i'm like well, tim really like I, I, I think i think what ha maybe maybe what happened was uh, he was just thinking about the you know the utility aspect of the ford f-150 you know how you know what you can do with the ford f-150 this can do as well and maybe better in other other things as well it doesn't tow as much that's for sure but um but yeah it, it didn't seem it was a little bit odd that's sort of what, what i mentioned it but i don't like criticism other journalists criticizing yeah. but i almost feel like i know tim we're friends and i can i can say that and not you know uh, you know and and not have him get all upset about it and since you brought it up i probably wouldn't have mentioned it but you talked Sorry. about the inside of his article with him and you know when i first read it i was just like I didn't learn anything about this van that's useful. Like, you know, that, that, that somebody who might want to be buying these for fleets would be interested in learning. And um, I think reviewers have to understand electric vehicles need to be reviewed as electric vehicles, not like, and talk about the, the, the specific electric bits and, and, you know, and, and you have to look at it from the perspective of the, uh, the average purchaser, what are they going to be looking for? You know, I don't want right. to, you know, review a, a, a Chevy Bolt EV, you know, from the perspective of someone who has three 911s in their garage, you, you know, like they're, they're going to be looking for different things in a vehicle. And uh, anyway, so, um, so, so look at this. I love the vehicle. Do you think it really, it fills the niche that it's supposed to do it? It kind of, it, it answers the questions that, or the, you know, that fills the role that a delivery van needs. Absolutely. This okay. has, it's got more than enough range for most business cases right. uh, these delivery vans i mean of course and, and also that's regional i'm talking from an east coast perspective where you know you can you can make 40 deliveries and be back in your depot and drive 80 miles you know and it might be different right. where kyle lives you know where things are more spread out and and maybe you need some more range um it's not going to work for everybody for every business use case like i said the lightning won't work if you need a pickup truck for every business use case. I think it'll work for a, a majority of business use cases, but not every one. Uh, this will work for most use cases that need van, that have a fleet of vans, and they will save a ton of money long-term on fuel and maintenance. Even if the van costs a little bit more up front, uh, and, and the best part about it is individuals, when, when we go buy cars, we look at MSRPs. We, we are 
we, that's what we're focused on. We can't, most people do not look at total cost of ownership, but businesses, when they shop for their next fleet of vehicles, they are all about total cost of ownership. They don't look at the MSRP. They don't care if that thing, if that costs twice what the next vehicle costs, they do a five-year running rate over maintenance and fuel and all that stuff. And if it costs less over five or six years or however many years their fleet is, that's the, that's the vehicle they purchase. So that makes even more sense why these electric vans are so good because the, the fleet managers really understand how to, how to do TCO and, and how to really look at what the total cost is. And this is going to be such a savings. These electric delivery vans, I can't wait to check out the Ram ProMaster EV. The new Ford, now you, st you said there's nothing comparable. The first gen Ford EV didn't go very far at all. The, the Transit. Right, um, e -transit and, yeah. right, neither did the first East printer, but um, uh, Ford in 2024 now is coming out with the second gen, and it's going to have comparable range to this. There's two okay. battery packs. I think the first one is uh, um, the small batteries. It's going to be about 165 miles of range, and the big battery is going to be about 200 miles, 195, I think they were quoting, which is very similar to this. Right. Now, the Ram ProMaster EV, I think they're saying about 168, and that's going to come out, I think, the end of this year. So... Um, I mean, there's those three vehicles there are the ones that I would like to see a side by side comparison. Don't compare this to a Lightning. It's people aren't cross shopping this with a Lightning or, or the Rivian too. Actually, well, the Rivian yeah. is a little bigger than this. Well, that Rivian comes in a different size, but the smallest one is 500 cubic feet, I believe. Yeah. So the Rivian's a little bit different. Yeah. And I don't know if they're uh, are they selling yet to like just an individual? Like if I own four vans, I, I can go buy them. You know, I, I'm I'm not Maybe sure. Maybe you Kyle own four. Yeah. But not one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. okay. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm I'm not sure what they're doing with that, but surely Mercedes, Ford, and Dodge, you can roll up to one of their dealerships and buy one. So, you know, I mean, if, if you're a fleet customer. So um, anyway, um, I love it. I can't wait till we get more electric delivery vans out there. They're, they're, they're per, it's, it's just a perfect use case. Is this, this and buses to me are, are just, you know, because they have set routes and they never right. vary from them. Uh, should, they should, we should just tomorrow make them all electric. It, it's just it's so much better in the city. It's just like cleaner vehicles, like less emissions inside the city. It makes a yeah. huge difference, actually. There's some, you know, some, you can look up some studies with uh, even with a small amount of electrification in a city core. There's like measurable improvements in air quality and health outcomes. So let me just kind of nerdy talk, but I think it's important. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, Kyle, did you have any uh, Sprinter thoughts? We you I own mean, a Sprinter, I, right? But I a diesel one. Yeah, but they, they didn't bring the first-gen e-sprinter to the U.S. That was front-wheel drive, by the way. Now this is rear-wheel drive. So um, I'm so excited about this. I mean, also, I'm very jealous of everyone who got to go. We did not get invited to go review the new e-sprinter. So it still shows out of spec, doesn't go to everything. Uh, and I'm so bummed because I, I totally agree with Tom. First of all, I didn't read Tim's article. I love Tim. I can't imagine he would write a bad article. But um, anyway, Um I thought that the coverage on this van in general, like I've watched a couple videos and they're like, I've never driven a van or reviewed a van. Well, I'm like, I own a van. I got friends who own businesses with vans. Why isn't out of spec here to talk about all of the van yeah. stuff? I and wish I, was I could so, have gone too, man. I so it was my, it was my job for a while driving these things. Well, it's like if there's one vehicle launch I wanted to be at, it was this one because I love yeah. – my sprinter. I love vans. I love electrification. And I don't know. I emailed Mercedes and I was like, you know, if you can get one to Colorado, I'd we, as soon as possible, we really need to like make a film on this. Um, anyway, I don't know. Uh, that's enough complaining, but, but ultimately, uh, it's got a great monster charging curve, LFP battery pack. You can full charge this thing every day. They're going to last forever. It's got the new electric motor. Like Tom said, huge payload. 2,600 pounds, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. You know, my Rivian's only like 2,000. It might be a right around there. It's not much more or less. But so that's in a van, which is pretty great. And you have a lot of room. Um, you know, it's certainly not like a 2,500 or 3,500. It's not a dual rear axle or anything heavy duty. But for around town, this will be great. Um, actually, uh, Mercedes did a road trip from Vegas to their technical center on one charge. And that's in Oxnard, I think. There, anyway, from Vegas to California, basically to the coast, okay. and they still had twelve percent remaining. Okay, yeah, two hundred miles in. Uh, I think it might get more than that in in the city of running around. Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. This is this is going to be a great van for. The thing is, we can't imagine all of the use cases of a van. 
everyone's got their own little thing and their own adaptation and their own outfitting and their own let's let me do this and this is going to work for so many more applications than any other van currently on the market today could do uh even the rivian amazon vans 91 92 kilowatt hour usable this is a whole nother level of extra capacity it's got you know not fast charging i still don't understand why the fast charging is an optional upgrade as far as i understand it there's no physical change it's just a software unlock from 50 to 115 but then just make it free and then give me an option to limit it to 50 for whatever reason you want and mercedes usually has an eco charging profile or something to limit it but it's a it's got freaking route planning plug in charge and on route battery preconditioning it will show you how many kilowatts you'll get when you plug it in i know the use case of dc charging is little but the point i'm trying to make is the toyota bz4x which is a series production customer vehicle still can't do route planning and here a freaking sprinter van has got it sorted so i think mercedes really knows what's up and I right. think we really need to keep a closer eye on them coming forward because I, I spoke to some of the engineers about the next generation of Mercedes EVs. I think they're going to be crazy. They're going to be wild. So right. here, the Sprinter, this is still like a lot of old tech, 400 volt, whatever. LFP, though, is awesome. And I'm very, very excited to spend some time with this van. Yeah, the LFP is a, is a kind of a big deal, actually, because, I mean, I like the, the performance of the NMC batteries, the nickel, uh, manganese, cobalt, but... Uh, the whole cobalt situation i've been looking in, into it more this week and i kind of thought it was things had calmed down but it really hasn't and it's really kind of bad <laughs> but what not, what's wrong with, like i've driven lfps that rip that are fast and charge great like you just, just a, get a new just a standard heavier. model three it's just a heavier, oh, than, heavier yeah yeah i mean it's just for vehicle dynamics like you'd never put uh, an lfp pack in the tycon for instance sure yeah for a sports car application but very few percentage of cars need performance i think Right. And, and LFP is actually, in this case, I thought it was very smart because, um, it, well, like it, it has plenty of cargo or weight capacity, you know, cargo capacity already. And just being able to plug into 100. And so you have your full range every day and not, you know, there's no penalty or no worries. Like with the NMC batteries, you can, you know, charge 80% every day. Well, if your range is only 200 miles, it's not necessarily great. You know, you want to have that, that full full range to unlock at the beginning of every day. Somebody had a good question here. Oh, here we go. Uh, Cord asked Kyle, what range and charging speed do you need to trade your Sprinter to EV Sprinter? Yeah, well, I think uh, I have done trips in my Sprinter up to Prudhoe Bay, Alaska in places that it would be impossible for an electric car to drive up there from here, from the US. Now, of course, people have driven electric cars to Prudhoe Bay, but they've shipped the car to Alaska and then drove up. But I'm talking right. about the thing with the van is it unlocks adventure. It takes the stress of having to charge away. I can put extra, and I have used extra diesel fuel tanks on the side for some adventures where we have gone out in the middle of nowhere. The thing is, I hate driving my diesel sprinter. It's slow. You have to let it warm up. You got to drive it on the highway so it can burn off with the diesel exhaust fluid and all the things. And it's just, I, I think I'm actually going to sell it. I really... I don't use it. It sat in front of my house for a year and I haven't used it. So I think I'm just going to get rid of it. But, um, and, and surprisingly values are quite high, but what, what would I need out of an electric van? I would need probably three to 400 kilowatt hours and probably 500. I mean, the charging speed at that point doesn't matter because I got my house with me. I could take a shower while it's charging. You know, it doesn't matter. I could cook something. Not that I, we, we, I never even use the kitchen anyway. I could do whatever. And, um, but you, you want know, like 300 kilowatt hours, 400 kilowatt hours. Yeah. Three, 400 kilowatt hours would get me maybe 300 miles, maybe 350 miles because it's so inefficient. I'd get like 11, 10 or 11 miles per gallon in my diesel because right. it's tall and I'm going through Wyoming and I'm not going to slow down. I'm doing 85, 90 miles an hour wide open everywhere. So, you know, right. there's, so that's just how you get through Wyoming. I guess the closest thing we have is the bright drop with the around 200 kilowatt hour motors. That's, that's 250 miles of range on that. Yeah. The, not enough. Not it's enough. Gonna it's going to take a while before our battery technology gets up to 300 kilowatt hours or more in a, in a, Sprinter van, I think, but yeah, basically what would work really well is maybe a 40 kilowatt hour battery pack with a combustion generator, basically right. volt drive train up right. sized. 
the e rev has it. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, like the RAM thing. Oh, uh, but while Kyle e wants that, that's such a small use case. Nobody's going to make it. Like, I, like I actually think they will, but and, and it's not as small of a use case as you think, Tom. Like, there are every RV now is pretty much a sprinter, and they build tens and tw and hundred thousand. I don't even know how many RVs a year, but like Winnebago is like a manufacturer just pumping them out, and they're all of them are built on sprinter chassis now, other than the big buses. So, I think there is a use case for. A, a an extended range electric vehicle that is a van. Sure. I think there would Why be a the cost? Just anything. make it gas. Like like if it's if 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 it's got a forty kilowatt hour battery pack, you ain't going anywhere with that. You're, you're running on gas the whole time sure. anyway. You know, like like but why add also, that complexity? But I think right. you run on gas a lot a lot at a lot more efficient levels. If your if your motor's are, when it runs, it's running at you know peak efficiency. And so like a plug-in hybrids, like the Honda Clarity, when it's running on gasoline, it actually gets like, I was it 45, 50 miles a gallon, something, it's a little crazy, like really great grass, gas mileage, which is just when it's on the, the whole gas, you know, when it's not, doesn't have any battery left. Yeah. I don't know. I think, I think it would, if it's an option and they make it really expensive, I still think they would sell more than anyone expects just maybe my limited viewpoint but everyone in colorado has a sprinter uh you know rv conversion they're literally on every corner and uh especially out in the west like uh, grid connection was saying just a ton of them just a ton of them i just want to go back to this comment uh ev kx says sorry yang wang uh u9 is lfp and so the u9 is a sports car from yang wang wang which is a byd uh sub brand and they're going to change that name to something else for the european market but the, uh, <laughs> no that's a great name they should keep it <laughs> i mean it gets attention right yang wang uh but the, so the yang wang u9 it's like I can't remember if it was like one thousand pounds more or two thousand pounds more than a, a, some like a similar car. It's like really heavy. <laughs> it's like kind of it's kind of crazy. Uh, I forget what it was like seven thousand pounds or something like. It's really heavy with the with the big LFP pack in it. Anyway, uh, let's see, Tom. Tom. Okay, we have like we have more news to cover, but Tom, I, I wanted to. I, you put out two videos this week. Uh, focused on two different Tesla uh, NACS Max to CCS1 adapters, one from A to Z EV and the other one from Electron. So I was wondering if you could tell us how those stacked up. So, um, well, I mean, they're not really, like, they're not reviews because I really can't use them yet. I, okay. I could if there were DC fast chargers in my area here that had already added, you know, J3400 plugs on them, but there aren't. I haven't been able to find them if there are. I know there's there's a bunch in California or whatever. So here's the two adapters. Noticeable size difference. Um, Lectron, A to Z. So these are the only two that are really out there right now. And um, obviously Tesla's going to be making their own. We don't know when exactly they're going to be coming out. So I interviewed the CEO of both companies, asked some questions about safety and um, mostly about safety and about what are you doing to make sure that this thing, these things are safe. I talked to them about the um, companies that they're working with because both companies are working with a number of existing OEMs. They can't mention their names because they're all under NDAs and the companies don't want, the, 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 the OEMs don't want their names being flat, f thrown around saying, oh yeah, the, you know, we're working with Ford and we're working with GM on this understandable it's typical ndas you know you don't talk about which companies you're working with but i can tell you for sure both companies are working with some of the major oems and and to get them to not object to them using their adapter they may not come out and say this is a a, a this adapter we are approving it they may not actually ever say that but they won't object to it they won't have an issue with it and what both of these companies are doing is giving the companies their these adapters and saying use them tell us if you have any problems with them what what are the, what are your say what are your concerns and then getting getting feedback this has been going on the last six months getting feedback and making the appropriate changes inside so that the the, the oems feel comfortable with their customers using those adapters some of the oems may even buy these and rebrand them their names like this might say Ford on it. And if you order a Ford adapter through Ford, you'd get this, but it would say Ford. We'll see how that pans out. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, oh yeah, and if you're watching us on YouTube, so Kyle is bringing up, you can purchase now for I think $250, 
the outline of UL2252, which is UL's working on a cert certification process for um, electric vehicle adapters. There's currently no standard to certify these and say they're UL approved. Like when we do electric vehicle charging equipment reviews, I talk about whether they're ETL certified, um, CSA certified, UL certified, but adapters have no certification process, no real official certification process. There's a couple out there. There's actually a UL2251, which is like a certification, but it really just tests how well it's made and how the connections on the inside, how well the connections are secured. It's not a full comprehensive adapter test. This UL2252 is what's supposed to be. One of the reasons why I brought this up and, and told Dom to post this um, graphic here is that there's a little discrepancy in the two videos when I talked to the two CEOs. Um, the CEO of uh, uh, A to Z, uh, which is this adapter here, Amin Zator, told me that UL2252 is still under um, development. It's not complete. UL has worked on it for the last year, but what they did was they gave it to all the OEMs again and said, guys, kick this around. Tell us what your concerns are. We can rewrite it. We can finalize it. Um, uh, and uh, the SAE is involved and everything. And you, then we'll get the standard and we will certify these adapters. A to Z told me it's not complete yet. A to Z actually told me that they're the only adapter company that's on the international SAE um, board. And so they have a seat at the table wow. working on, working on um, th th this. When I talked to Electron's uh, CEO, uh, Chris Malwald, he told me that U2, uh, UL2252 is complete and that his adapter is currently being tested by UL. So I went back and talked to A to Z and said, hey, um, this is what he had. And basically they said, well, he's wrong. It's not complete. And his adapter can't be being certified officially by, by UL. They may be looking at it to tell them if it conforms with the current version of UL2252, but it's not complete and it can't be certified. So I, I, I have uh, two, two different opinions right now on this. I'm going to continue to follow up on it. Um, I'm going to get the Tesla adapter um, and then test all three of them side by side on different chargers. I'm going to go all around, measure the heat on them and all this. But, um, you know, I, I didn't make these videos to recommend either product. I made these videos to, um, say, take the cover off what these companies are doing because I know people that are interested in buying these don't have access that I have to talk to the CEOs and ask some questions about the product. So that's really why I made these videos. It wasn't to endorse a product or tell you to buy it. And I say that in the videos, I'm not endorsing this, this sure. adapter. I just want to expose what the companies are doing to hopefully make them safe. And then you decide which, which, which is the right one for you. Um, you know, it's easy to say, oh, just buy the Tesla adapter. Tesla's not an adapter company. Tesla's adapters fail too. You know, I, I know some of my followers have had their uh, uh, you know, CCS to Tesla adapters fail on them after using them not too long. Um, I have to believe Tesla's going to make a pretty robust adapter. Doesn't mm -hmm. mean other companies won't either, but some of them will definitely be bad. We know that for a fact. We've seen that. Uh, so as soon as UL can certify adapters and there is one adapter on the market that is UL certified, that's the only one I'll recommend. Um, but right now we're in this gray period where none of the adapters are approved. So the best thing I can do is try to, uh, you know, uh, show people, get some transparency out there and talk to these companies and say, listen, tell us what you're doing with these adapters so, so that you're, you're proving that they're going to be safe and that there's no issue using them on my EV. Right. Uh, EV KX asks, is there a way, to, is there a way that the charger knows that the car is from a brand with a deal? with Tesla or would it work on any CCS one car? These are passive. These are dumb. Right. There's no, there's no, there's no smarts inside these. So the car doesn't know the charger doesn't know. Well, that um, is unless the Tesla adapter isn't dumb. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I, I'm, you know, we'll see, uh, the, w w what I'm getting from multiple sources is that it's, it's, it also is going to be dumb, but maybe it won't be. We'll see. The smidge 204 says the CCS protocol involves sharing a MAC address that's unique to the vehicle. So it's technically possible to block or allow based on that. But yeah, technically know. that 
is not 100% accurate. Okay. The Mac ID is only for auto charge plus, and some vehicles do not have a unique Mac ID that they communicate to the charger. The only way to do that is one way for certain vehicles, GM, Rivian, just now, uh, and a few other vehicles will share Mac ID. Tesla does, but the the more standard, safer way of doing this is actually with uh, certificate exchange. With there's a whole process within. ISO 15118 that explains how to do a secure exchange so that there is no privacy being breached, no payment that could be breached, things like that. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't see any reason to buy this adapter right now. It doesn't help you, but I'm really excited for when it opens up in maybe even a few weeks or months or something where I'm not sure what the adapter is going to help because it sounds like at least with Ford, Ford will be providing everyone an adapter for free. So that's and Rivian great. too, I believe, Kyle. Okay, and yeah, Rivian too. too. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So yeah. you're going to have the official adapter coming at a no charge uh, for at least the the first brand that's going to open up. I'm not sure every brand will do this. I hope they follow it. And um, yeah, it, it'll be really interesting to see how this all plays out. Um, I'm not against third party adapters as long as they're safe and they have a, a a certain procedure where you can check to ensure that they stay safe throughout multiple life cycles and multiple usage of the product we see the actual connectors on the chargers damaged all the time completely fried um and so i'm sure these are going to fare just about the same if not worse or or maybe slightly better but things get damaged and what i want to make sure is people don't plug in a damaged adapter to the charger safety is always the top priority i'm sure the all the adapters are going to work on day one just fine everyone be like oh my car didn't blow up but if that's the first <laughs> time you're using it so i don't know we'll see how this goes it was i listened to uh the the podcast or the videos that tom did with the with the guys i thought okay i agree a little bit of discrepancy here and there but uh we're we're getting on the right track and safety is a it seems to be a goal of all of the companies so that's good right well to, to me to me that was a big thing um one company saying it's it's finalized and our adapter is being certified currently and the other company saying that's not true it's not finalized you can't get it certified so i am going to find out who's telling the truth and it might not even it's possible it might not be t who's telling the truth who's right. misinformed could because you know ceos of companies don't always know all the little details, particularly Electron. Electron's a really big company, much bigger than than A to yeah. Z, and 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 with with tons of employees and and offices and you know in different parts of the world and everything. So it's possible that um, he wasn't like his people told him. Oh yeah, UL is is testing our 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 adapter, but but that was you know testing it for conforming with the current working model of UL two two five two. And, you know, of course, he didn't know what I was going to be asking him. So, you know, maybe that caught him by surprise. And he was like, oh, yeah, our, 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 our. But, but I, if you notice, when I asked him, I followed up and said, I wasn't under the impression this wasn't finalized. And are you sure you're telling me that it's done and your adapter is is being certified? And he was like, yep, it's done. So he was pretty strong on that. He didn't say, oh, let me check with my people. Uh, so but we'll, we'll, we'll see it, 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 we got two different answers from, from two different CEOs. And, um, you know, I, I don't know what, um, which one is, is, um, is misinformed or not, not telling us com the complete truth, but I'll figure it out for sure. And, um, and we'll report on it and, uh, hopefully I'll get, uh, one of my adapters from Ford or Rivian for, uh, we'll see what, wh which one that is. And if it comes from Tesla and Kyle said, I don't know why you would buy one. And I agree with him to a d degree, but I'll tell you why some of my followers are saying, I want to buy one now, even if Ford's going to be sending me the adapter, you're not going to be getting your adapter on day one. Right. Ford has like 70,000, 60 or 70,000 customers that would qualify for the, for this adapter. It's going to take months. Like you, you might fill in your form to get your your adapter. Like when Ford's saying springish, when they're gonna they're gonna open up their 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 vehicles are gonna be able to use superchargers. So they might tell you to fill out this form at your VIN and everything. You might get your adapter in December. <laughs> and mm. if you're on road trips in over over the summer, you you want access. I know a lot of people are gonna say, you know what? I'll buy the I'll pay. The damn thing, and I'll I'll sell it when I get my second one for half price, and maybe lose you know just a hundred bucks. But uh, there's people that want it day one when this opens up. 
you're not getting your free adapter day one. They won't be able to make them fast enough because just think if Ford's given away the, to their customers and Rivian's given away to their customers, that's like just those two companies have 175,000 of them that have to get shipped out. And, and let's say they're getting them from Tesla, right? Because that, that, that's some of the people assume that, that they're going to be Tesla's adapter is going to be their official adapter. We don't know all this yet. So on day one, you know, Tesla might be, might be making them already. We don't know that. They might be stockpiling them but without even the, giving them to one of their customers. They have to have 175,000 of them made to give to Ford and Rivian. Well, <laughs> well I mean, I get your point, but I don't think Rivian's getting them at the same time as Ford. Only Ford is getting them to start. To start. Okay. All right. But still, that's still what? 60,000. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree yeah. with you, but, yeah. but we are not, there is no confirmation and maybe it'll work just fine, but I don't think there's any confirmation that we know these will actually work on a supercharger. Right. And well, yeah. Right. Until we try them. Right. right. Because no what if Tesla has a chip in it? That's like, Oh, official adapter chip that we don't know about. I'm not saying it does. I doubt it does. It adds cost complexity. Right. Is it worth right. it? I don't know, but I'm just saying there's a possibility we don't know. And so, well, yeah, for 200 bucks, it's a fun gamble. May as well. Both of these companies have had discussions with Tesla. So if it, yeah, right. I would have to believe if that was the case, yeah, it would have been a non-starter. They sure. would have invested all the money that they did to make these damn things. So, uh, you know, I, I, I have to believe, Kyle, if that was the case, Tesla would have told them, you know what, guys, don't even go down that road because we're going to have an authentication process in ours. People are not going to be able to use them. I am almost a hundred percent certain that's not going to be the case, but we'll okay, see. Okay, great. Well, that's, that's good news. So basically if you're a super nerd and want to charge like me on day one, maybe I'll order one of each. And uh, then, then that way we can get the videos in as soon as it opens up. Wow. It would be interesting if they don't work the same like if the you know one for some reason limits current somehow you know if there's, they're dumb if they're, they're both 500 amp thousand volt like i mean i, so I guess it, should, it, it could be, be but you know we'll 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 you know power's just passing see through what here. happens because one of them has a peak rating so i want to see what happens when i plug hummer ev or one of these cars that can pull big amperage uh you know not in split pack should be kind of interesting Right. Uh, real quick, uh, Grid Connections had asked earlier, and thank you for the uh, donation. Does the uh, panel that think that the adapters slash EV dongles issue on cars will have a noticeable impact and turn off buyers from going EV this year? I don't think people will research enough to know in mass exactly. quantities. That's, that's that's my opinion. Yeah. Okay. The average person, especially someone that's new to EVs, isn't even, that's not on their radar yet. Sorry, I'm a little coughing over here. I'm just recovering from a, I think I had a touch of the flu. Uh, yeah, getting better. Uh, so let's move along. Uh, yesterday we learned that the Rivian R1T and R1S have two, two new, uh, more affordable battery options called Standard and Standard Plus. The Standard Battery is available on dual motor versions, while the Standard Plus is available for both dual and quad motor trims. The smallest pack is 106 kilowatt hours and Rivian estimates it should get 270 miles of range while the standard plus is 106 kilowatt hours. Wait a second. No, that shouldn't be the same. Oops. I, I have my numbers wrong. Um, I don't know if I can look that up real quick, but it should get 350 mile, 315 miles of range on the, uh, the standard plus. So the new pack makes the, uh, the new packs make the most affordable Rivian now $69,900. That's the R1T dual motor standard pack before delivery and other fees. And the base R1S is now $74,900. So Kyle and Tom, you're both Rivian owners. One of you has the, the SUV, one of you has the, the truck. It's a, it's a smaller, uh, is a smaller battery something that you would have been interested in? Or are you guys all about the long range and damn the bank account? So I, I would be something I would be interested in. I don't I don't have the need for extraordinarily long range. I mean, just when I drive up to Vermont, it's it's the only time. It's nice that both of the vehicles, my my Lightning and my Rivian, can make it to my in-laws' house, which is a little over 200 miles, even in the dead of winter, under the worst conditions, without needing to stop as long as I plug it in before I go and and leave it 100. Um, percent So which I forgot to do the last time that I went up to Vermont, so I did have to stop. But, uh, 
you know, other than that trip for me, the, the range on my Rivian and my Lightning is just overkill. I'm, 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 I'm never in a single day, I won't say never, I'm rarely in a single day accessing more than half of my pack. So, okay. you know, uh, for me, I, I would have considered it if it was a significant savings. So can you, you, could, you can't get up to uh, Vermont on the, on the standard battery, though, right? You no. have to charge? Okay. Yeah, I'd have to charge. I'd have to stop and charge. So, Kyle, I, I, I got I to think you want the big battery. Well, I don't represent the most average no. car buyer. Right. <laughs> so, really? yeah. Yeah, that's, yep. Most so, people don't have 18 news. cars in their driveway? <laughs> sure, yeah. So, you know, Sorry. I, uh, yeah. Um, I like the biggest range because I tow with my truck. So even, I don't think I'd spend the 10 grand for a new Max Pack, but I would spend more than the average person or more than I would recommend someone to spend to get the Max Pack, which isn't that much benefit, to be honest. Uh, but, but range is important to me in a truck because when I put a trailer on it, the range is halved. And so... I am a huge fan. We did a whole podcast on this yesterday. So if you want all the details, it's on out of spec podcast. Uh, but we, it's, it's such a good option for so many people because most people I have to imagine are just cruising around town, doing their commuting, take the occasional trip. And it's not like this is going to be that different on the occasional trip because the big battery packs do not charge well up top. They really slow down up top. So your benefit is, I don't know what the charging curve will be on this, but the benefit perhaps on a road trip isn't going to be that much more uh, going with the big battery pack other than the initial full charge. So this is uh, at least the standard one is a software lock standard plus uh, Rivian said they use NCA chemistry, but I think it's still NCM, uh, you know, just standard uh, battery pack chemistry. It's not LFP. It's not the our EDV Rivian uh, adventure or uh, van pack. And that will be coming sometime mid to late 24 is the LFP Rivian. So this seems like a weird stopgap, uh, kind of a weird option. I don't know if they're all large packs that are software limited or if it's a physically different battery pack than the large pack. And then, you know, the standard plus is the fully unlocked one and the standard is software limited. But for sure, the standard standard plus have, has a software buffer. It's thirty five hundred dollars for forty five miles of EPA range extra. I think, and and I think probably Rivian will let you buy it and open it up later on. So I think that's probably worth it for most people. But I do like the idea of just getting the the fully locked battery, charging it up to hundred percent every day, not worrying about it. Uh, because it's software locked, you'll have a better charging curve, zero to hundred um, percent, because it doesn't have to ever top charge. So, yeah, I'm not sure there's going to be that much benefit going with a fully unlocked pack. Okay. So, more affordable Rivians right there. Yeah, you I can get a Rivian that. now for under 70 grand, brand new. Yeah, before, well, before uh, delivery fees and all that stuff. And before your tax credits. Yeah. I guess we I can mention about that you, too. Kyle, but they're all over here. Oh, it's yeah. crazy how many R1Ss are in my area. I, oh, really? I, I can't drive to the coffee shop without seeing yeah. one. It's sure. nuts. How many, they're on every they, corner. They, they, yeah, uh, they must be, uh, you know, they must be selling a lot of vehicles because they're yes. all over the place around here. They're pretty sharp, I got to say. Uh, I should mention, too, that Rivian will reveal the the uh, R2 electric SUV on the March 7th. So that's coming up and something to look forward to. Uh, yeah, I'll really be there. Much. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, where is that happening at? In uh, California, Laguna Beach, I think. Okay. It's at their new, like, theater, the Rivian Theater. Ah, oh, right, right. Yeah, I saw, I saw some pictures of that online. That's That looks really nice, that place. There's some other news. Sorry to go barge ahead. in. No, go ahead. Um, there will be a... Ch uh, I've heard the rumors that there will be a charging network announcement today that we should all pay attention to in a few hours. Oh, really? From Irvian? Yeah. No. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can't say anything more beyond that because I really don't know anything more beyond that, but let's just keep our eyes peeled. It's nothing to do with the Electrify America indoor charging station with 20 hyper fast. No, cars. that's already been announced. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. Oh, here's someone had a question for you, Kyle. Um, Kyle, about Tycon, will Audi e-tron GT get the same updates? Any news? Uh, nothing official, but I'm fairly certain J12, which is what that platform is called, the, the facelift one, will okay. translate to the e-tron gt right that makes total sense 
And just kind of beside the point of the show, but someone's asking, how do you order the? the if you're willing to spend two dollars to ask me how I order my <laughs> drink, you can go watch a video where I've put it in fifty times. <laughs> Thanks, Kayvon. Always appreciate the support, but no, I'm not giving it away for for that. That's a, a such a non non on topic question. It's a is a secret formulation. Yeah, let's let's keep it let's keep it EVs here. That drink has been publicized all over the place. All right. Yeah. Uh, so Kyle, for those who don't know, Kyle's kind of known for always having this, you know, this particular drink in his cars when he's when he's driving and testing stuff. So it's kind of great. Um, so news wise, Ford releases Q4 earnings uh, this week and held a call, of course. And on it, Jim Farley, the CEO, said we made a bet in silence two years ago and we developed a super talented skunkworks team to create a low cost EV platform. It was a small group, a small team, some of the best EV engineers in the world, and it was separate from the Ford mothership. <clears throat> so all of our all of our EV teams are ruthlessly focused on cost and efficiency in our EV products because the ultimate competition is going to be the affordable Tesla and the Chinese OEMs. So basically Ford has had this team working in secret in Irvine, California, developing a new low cost platform for several smaller vehicles, as I understand it. It's being run by Alan Clark, who was the uh, director of new programs engineering, and he worked on uh, at Tesla, and he, he worked on the Roadster and the Model 3 and the Model Y, and he was joined more recently by uh, Anil Pryani, who also worked at Tesla in the early, early days for a number of years with Clark before starting his own company called Automotive Power, or AMP for short, which Ford bought a couple months ago, and so he joined that effort then, I, from what I can tell. So this is kind of interesting news. It's just, I mean, not product, there's no product yet that we can see, but we can kind of at least look down the road and, you know, see Ford is already looking at low cost platforms. So people are always talking about more affordable EVs. When can we get, you know, more affordable EVs? Well, Ford is, is uh, coming up with one. I'm kind of su almost surprised though that, that it's doing this. Mm, well, I'm not surprised that they're doing it necessarily. It has to happen at some point, but, is this like so low cost cars? There's just less less there's less profit there, right? I mean, the, the eventually you want to cover every uh, niche of the marketplace, but I don't know. Tom, do you have any? What do you, what'd you think about this news? Yeah, it really didn't surprise me. I I didn't know they would be going about it like with like a, a small skunk works team working on it. I mean, I would imagine every company should be you know there should be. Uh, you know, having some sort of dedicated team working on getting costs down on on EVs and bringing a platform out that um, you'd be able to sell an affordable affordable EV. Uh, so it, it really doesn't. It, it's a little surprising of the way they're doing it. Um, I I hope that it it uh, you know comes to fruition that that they develop something worthwhile because you know as we've been saying and I know it's pretty obvious. Uh, we need to get the cost down on EVs, and it's got to. It, we can't just wait for batteries to get less expensive because they've been getting less expensive for the last decade, and uh, they're not going to drop in price at the rate that they had been because they've gotten to a point now where they're they're not crazy expensive anymore. And and you know we were seeing every year like ten percent decreases in in in. In, in battery prices for like 10 years or whatever. And now it's, it's, it's to the point where, you know, you're getting like a percentage here and a percentage there. So they've got to figure out other ways of getting the price down. And um, hopefully Ford uh, will, will bring something uh, to market that mass market people can afford. Was it Mark Longor Longoria says Maverick EV, Maverick EV for retail. Oh yeah. I'd love customers. that. A small, yeah. small, that's you what know, everyone electric, wants, right? For electric like truck, yeah. Time. yeah. It's like, yeah. I don't know, or even Tacoma size, which is a little bigger than Maverick, but, you know, right. a, a, a smaller electric pickup truck. Yeah, we love small electric trucks. Right. Any, any thoughts on the, the news, uh, Kyle? You, I know you're more into actual product and yeah. future plans. I mean, it, it all sounds good to me. Right. Yeah, I'm just, yeah. Uh, so we just have a few other like, uh, news things to talk about here, like a few other headlines. I'm not sure if we want to get too deep into any of these things, but uh, Toyota also has, uh, 
committed to another billion dollars in its investment. So it's it's building a, it's 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 going to build a, an electric three row SUV at its uh, Kentucky plant, which is I think one of the biggest ones in the world. And uh, so it's it's yeah it's just announced that it's putting an extra one more billion dollars in into that effort, and that brings its total investment up to ten billion dollars. Which so Toyota, you know, it's always it's always often been accused of you know dragging its feet on EVs and not doing this and that, not doing enough. But you know, those are big numbers, I think, and I I think we should probably you know understand that they do have stuff coming hopefully it'll be better than the than the, what they've shown us so far as far as the bz4x and uh, yeah right um someone had mentioned that they could be called the bz5x but i kind of have a feeling it would be more like bz7 no or something. so i heard a rumor that they're dropping the bz name oh really beyond zero yeah yeah i mean it's a lot of it's it's not great i don't it's stupid don't, it's, and it really i was also with anybody I was also at the Lexus booth at the Chicago Auto Show, and they had a sign that said, the future is electric. Oh, really? Well, nice. That's so a, you are, that's you, a you're, surprise. You're in Chicago right now, aren't you? Yes, I'm in Chicago at the Auto Show right now. But it's so boring. There's literally nothing to talk about that's here. Right. I, yeah, I can't imagine. There's. I didn't see also. I saw Maki vlog folks are there, uh, Patrick and Liv. And so they showed a few things, but they were all things that we've seen already, like the Ford Maki Rally and uh, the the new Maki with the, the uh, green and gold or bronze package it looks great but you know kind of when you go to a like an auto show you kind of hoping to see something new i think we had a few updates uh in ice vehicles from kia basically that's been like the big news chicago is kind of a snooze fest this year it, it feels like but uh oh we got a question tom any update on the tesla universal wall connector update for the tesla app no, I actually have to ping Tesla again because I, I um, my contact that actually sent me the units uh, has been great getting back to me when I contact them. And I, I, I asked him some questions about the app, got it probably almost a month ago. I think it was early January and he hasn't got back to me. So I got to ping him again because I do want to do a follow up on on that. And I want to uh, talk a little bit more about the app and, and some of the features and also how to commission it because some of the uh, some of my followers mentioned to me that they were having difficulty commissioning it. And um, so I want to do a step-by-step -step process video to explains how to commission the station and also then go over some of the app features. Um, thanks for reminding me. I, I, I need reminders every now and then. I got a, a lot of things and I, I have a million things that I want to do and I start it and then it gets stalled and then it just falls off the radar because I get hit up with other stuff. So right. um, I'm actually flying uh, something. This happens a lot. I'm sure it happens with Kyle. So, you know, you're working on something. Then all of a sudden something else comes up. You got to drop everything and do it. I'm actually flying to Texas on Monday for the day because I have a, cus uh, a follower who's um, a Tesla a wall connector had a serious electrical problem. And uh, it was all done by a licensed electrician. It was permitted. And uh, did, he did some things incorrectly. And the person's house almost caught on fire. And uh, I'm going to go down and analyze it, um, make a video of uh, talk about what went wrong, and then fix it. And then and, and um, uh, you know get the guy up and, and charging his Model Y again. So uh, that'll be up on uh, my channel next week at some point. So I'm actually using, as you can imagine, my 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 channel sponsor here, Qmerit. I got a um, uh, a local Qmerit contractor is going to meet me on site. We're going to inspect everything and uh, figure out what went wrong and then fix it for the guy. You know, that's, that should be pretty cool. I guess we'll talk about that next week then. Yep. All right. Um, another bit of news. GM just poached Tesla's all-time great battery wait, chief. Wait, I'm so oh. sorry. I just got some news for the Rivian folks from okay. my friend Jose. He said, we got the battery pack kilowatt hour usable of uh the, the new battery pack so sorry we're going a little bit back in time but oh, oh sure sure Let me... uh standard is 106 kilowatt hours standard plus 121 large is 131 and max is 141 right so yeah the the, the smallest is 106 what was the next one standard plus yeah 121 so the cheapest okay. price delta is for the most amount of kilowatt hours to go from standard to standard plus oh interesting so my guess is maybe the standard and standard plus are just large packs that are both software limited. 
Because why would they develop a whole new pack? Yeah. That's a lot of work yeah. for that. Yeah. yeah and, I don't know. And I'm... 10 kilowatts is what you get. 10 kilowatt hour for max pack. Yeah, well, that's 10 grand. 141. So I know that's what I'm saying. <laughs> that's 10 grand. And then to go from, from standard plus to large, I don't know, a 6,000, I think. And then it's 3,400. And, and so it's like for you get, you have to pay more for decreasing benefit. Hmm. Yeah. I don't, I don't understand that. Um, but I, and I also don't understand. I, I don't like that whole, you know, standard, standard plus it's the same battery. It's the same hardware. So you can order like this, the standard and they're sending you all that stuff. I, I just don't get it. Maybe find a price Delta in the middle and give, give everybody the, you know, all the use of all the cells and the, all the energy available. I don't understand the, the point of like artificially eliminating a pack and then selling it at a lower price. Well, it's just get people in the vehicles. You can sell a higher quantity and all of those vehicles can be upgraded at a later point in time, uh, which would be, you know, revenue down the line that could be realized. Yeah. And it yeah. might actually cost them more, Dom, to engineer a new smaller pack change the assembly line, you know, have, have sure. two different ones on there. It, they might save money by just saying, just give them all that size and we'll software limit it. That's, that's a fair point. Um, so speaking of batteries, GM just poached uh, Tesla's all-time battery chief. So Kurt Kelty, who was the senior director of battery technology at Tesla from 2006 to 2017. Uh, and he was then the VP of commercialization at Sela Tech Nanotechnologies, a battery materials company that's focused on silicone uh, anodes, silicone, silicon anodes not silicone uh and he will serve as gm's vice president of batteries and will be responsible for building out the automaker's new battery strategy which is i think pretty great because you know i, I haven't really been in the, the gm batteries all seem to be super heavy i don't know what the, if it's just i'm not uh, i don't understand what's going on there so much but they just like i don't know they seem to be really heavier than they, they ought to be and so I don't know. They have someone new in charge and hopefully we'll see some benef benefit from that. I don't know if anyone has anything to say about that, but, and one other, I guess, end on this. Geely plans to introduce Zeker to Mexico. Uh, and uh, so we have to ask, you know, is, is it gonna come to the US at some point then? Because the, the idea is, so Zeker is the, uh, a brand is like owned by Geely. It's a sister brand, I guess you could say to Polestar. It's kind of similar to Polestar in a lot of ways, but its own styling and its own software as well. It doesn't use the same OS as uh, the Polestars do. Um, so the idea is that they could start manufacturing in Mexico, like sell them now and start manufacturing and then sell into the US the cars that are manufactured in, Me in Mexico, avoiding the tariffs that hit the cars that are made in China. Uh, so last November, it brought a number of cars and journalists to uh, Monticello, New York, to try out a few different models. And that, so that pro probably cost a good bit of money to put together. And so why would you do that, you know, if you're not, if you don't have like an eye on this market? You know, I, it's, I think it could be seen as, as an initial introduction to the brand for American journalists and uh, consumers. Uh, any, any thoughts on that, Tom? Well, uh all the Chinese manufacturers have an eye on this market. They're just figuring out, you know, how to do it. You know, what's going to be their plan. You know, they're not going to bring the vehicles over here if they're all, you know, getting $15,000 tariffs. So, you know, and, and as this seems to be, Mexico is going to be the key to get in, you know, and uh, they're going to build factories in Mexico and we're going to have Chinese EVs in the U S guys. And it's, it's, it's going to be a wave of, of EVs by the end of this decade. I've been saying it for a long time. We're going we're gonna to start to see a flood of them by the middle of next decade. Chinese vehicles in the U.S. are going to be as popular as, as the other Asian brands, as, as Korean and Japanese. Uh, Speaking of gonna be Korean of brands, we haven't spoken about it on this show yet, but I picked up an EV9 this week. Oh, that's true, right. Mm -hmm. But maybe we'll talk about it next week. Because I would like to put it up at the beginning of the show, because more people watch the beginning, we can talk about the delivery experience and ownership and uh, that video should go up either today or tomorrow. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, let's talk about that next week for sure. Yeah. I, I, I asked my mind when I was putting the show together. Uh, right. And there's the video's not out yet anyway. So yeah, it's okay. We can always talk about stuff before the video. So, uh, and my e-golf is a new color, not to go on a rant, but it, the video was just posted. It's my first time seeing it. Yeah. It looks great. It's crazy. It's, 
just an awful green color for an awful car, but I love it so much. So pea soup. It's yeah. Like baby poop green. Yeah, but I think it looks good. It's got all new suspension. It's slammed on the ground now, full okay. Euro tuner. And um, yeah, it looks looks sick. Can't wait to drive it. Oh, Mark Shellard asks, Kyle, is Francie's VF8 a brick yet? Um, and then Hey Francie replied, hey, and Fra- oh, it's oh, alive. <laughs> hey Francie, where are you? Hey Francie. And then you can follow Hey Francie or for Francie on on Twitter. I think she's Hey Francie on, on Twitter as well. And she has a great little clip on there uh, of her with a sound system. I'm not sure what was going on with that, but it's like possessed, basically. Yes, um, basically possessed. <laughs> but the car, to be honest, she for for what she's done with it, and she drove it 800 miles. It's like got it doesn't have a bad charging curve. And it's got pretty good driver assistance, and yet it's buggy and quirky. But I think we we got this thing expecting it to be a total disaster and it's okay. not a total disaster. It's just That's a good. minor disaster. So it it's like exceeding an, uh, expectations. It sounds like a bit of an adventure, uh, an adventure at least. So I'm, I'm going to have, uh, I was talking to, to Francie this week and I think we're going to do an interview with her and get do a little midweek episode next week. Uh, just get into the details of that whole experience. And she has a, on the out of spec motoring channel, uh, there's the video is now up of her and Jordan, I believe, going making the, the initial road trip in it. I forget how many miles. How many miles was that road trip? Yeah, eight hundred and a bit. Eight hundred. Yeah. So it, that's definitely uh, worth checking out. I need to actually watch all that content and uh, get up to speed myself. But it was really, really interesting. I watched. I'm still not through it yet, but I thought it was a fun fun watch so far. Yeah. But then yeah. she also has a podcast going up uh, tomorrow. I. Th- think on you know sort of a podcast detailing the whole road trip for the outspec podcast but of course francie can come on anytime so uh whenever she's free you should have her on here yeah we'll be, we'll be doing that next week all right so i think that's everything anything else anybody want to talk about i think we got it all right oh here's a uh, francie replying yes true we have one podcast about the leasing and one co- incoming about the road trip and the motoring video part one Oh, part, there's two parts. Okay. Or more than one part is live. All right. And th- thanks to Robin for that super sticker. Thanks, Robin. All right. So uh, I guess that brings us to the end of our show. Um, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please leave them below or get in touch with us on the social media platform of your choice. Don't forget, if you like the show, uh, please give us a thumbs up, click subscribe, tap that bell icon for notifications. Thank you all very much for joining us, and we'll see you again real soon. Ciao.